Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. About 25 to 35 miles southeast from Silverton in Marion County, I was out hunting with my dad, and he had put me on a post. I had been there for about one and a half hours when I saw what I thought to be a deer. It turned out to be an elk. After about two minutes, the elk took off fast. I then heard faint footsteps off in the distance. The footsteps were not loud. I was watching to see what it was, thinking it was another hunter. That's when I think I saw a Bigfoot. This animal looked to be at least eight feet tall. I never saw any legs because of the bushes in the way, but I did see one arm. The arm looked like they could be three quarters the length of the animal. I went back to the same area two days later and saw what looked like just the front half of a footprint. It was a shallow footprint. I went back that afternoon to take a mold of it so people wouldn't think I'm nuts, but the print was gone. I still don't know what I saw, but I know it was nothing I had seen before or since. The description of the creature. It was a dark brown, maybe lighter, about eight feet tall with long arms, I would guess at about three quarters of the length of the animal. It was a fast moving animal. I notified a friend and a so-called Bigfoot investigator about a year ago. He claims he has heard Bigfoot in the same area. On to the next story. In Redmond in Deschutes County in Oregon, a man and his wife were at the Redmond Lava Caves near the airport when they heard a howl out of one of the caves during the early evening. Suddenly, an immense creature came from one of the caves only 50 to 60 feet from them. It just walked out of the cave and then walked quickly away, apparently not noticing the couple. It left 22-inch tracks in the sand. And it was really ugly, they said. The eight-foot creature was sandy-colored with a peaked head with very broad shoulders and no hair on the face, hands, or feet. On to the next one. Myself and two friends were invited to go camping on Mount Hood, just below the Timberline Lodge. We had some friends who worked at the ski resort, and they camped out in the woods right there at the resort. We had gotten there Friday afternoon. Saturday evening, sitting around the campfire, a strange sound came from the woods directly below us. My friend, B, knowing we were avid outdoorsmen, asked if we knew what kind of animal was making the noise. We listened for a few minutes. The sound we heard was unlike anything I have ever heard before. It was kind of like a human scream, roar, laughter all mixed together. It was definitely not a human. The volume was too loud. B said that they had heard it a few times before. They assumed it was a coyote. We laughed, saying that it wasn't a coyote. It wasn't a deer, elk, bear, coyote, fox, raccoon, human, owl, nothing. This was all new to us. We listened for about 25 minutes as it circled our camp and then the sound stopped. All the time, we could hear something large walking through the brush. Well, we did kind of discuss it being Bigfoot, but jokingly. Three days after getting home from camping, we were all watching a program on Discovery Channel about Bigfoot. A guy had an audio clip of Bigfoot just after seeing it. When he pushed play, wow, we were blown away. It was the exact same sound we had heard on Mount Hood. Not many people believe us, but oh well. Well, that's my story. On to the next one. 
My wife and I had decided to go camping for a couple of days. We loaded up the camper. Big Creek is where we like to go. We lived in a little town called Long Creek in eastern Oregon, and Big Creek isn't really that far. It's 14 miles to the middle fork of John Day River, and then upstream another 25 or so miles on a country road. Then you turn up the Big Creek Road and go another six miles. Anyway, that will get you in the area of our encounter. We had gone to bed about 10. I was asleep when my wife woke me up to listen to a strange noise she had been hearing for over an hour or so. Well, I listened for a little while, and I didn't hear anything, and was trying to get back to sleep. All of a sudden, I heard what she had been hearing. I've been in the woods my whole life, hunting, fishing, cutting firewood, not to mention the years I've spent hauling logs out of the woods. I'll tell you what that was the strangest sound I had ever heard. Almost like a screaming howl. It made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. My wife said that it was moving around us, because she had heard it in four different spots since the first time she had heard it. She said it sounded closer now than the time before. Needless to say, we were both wide awake by this time, and then it screamed again, and it was in a new spot. Either it moved around, or there was more than one. We were just lying there with the window open, staring into the dark. It was a little cloudy, so there was not much light out, but we were still trying to see something. All this time, our two brave dogs that normally bark at everything were hiding under the table, shaking. No matter what we did, they didn't move. Then it screamed again, and it sounded really close and loud. I got out of bed and grabbed the gun, a twenty-two that almost made me feel worse. Anyway, we loaded up right then. My wife held the gun and flashlight while I got out of the camper, as I'm disabled, and then I held the light and pea shooter while she tried to hurry and put everything inside. To sum up that part, we left. When we got home, we went straight to bed in the morning. We found out that one of the dogs was so scared she pooped on herself in the camper. She has never done anything like that before or since. We just kind of didn't talk about it too much until that show came on, Mysterious Encounters. They played a recording of a Bigfoot, and when we heard it, it sent goosebumps all over my skin, and my hair stood up again, and so did my wife's. That's the same sound we had listened to that night. Oh, and by the way, it was about 2 a.m. when I first heard it, but my wife said she had been listening to it for well over an hour. Well, that's it. I can't think of anything else that happened that night, but if my wife or I remember anything, we'll let you know. Just the dogs. They always bark at every little noise. For them to act so scared was really odd. And... For Tasha to mess herself was something she has never done before or since. It must have started at about 1 a.m. It was a little cloudy, but still warm out, about 60 degrees or so. It was dry, but had a little rain shower earlier in that day at about 4 p.m. It was fairly dark. You could see the skyline, but not too much else. It was a pine and fir forest with lots of trees. There was a spring just up the road about half of a mile that has a pipe that runs ice-cold, fresh spring water year-round. We were only about 50 feet from Big Creek, and it's really cold all year-round. Also, there's lots of mountains and valleys. It's very quiet there. The area is not used very much. It's too far from the river for most people. A friend of my son said when he was still in high school saw what he thinks is a young Bigfoot about five feet tall. It ran across the road in front of him one morning on his way to school. It happened on the south end of the middle fork of the John Day River, which is where you'll turn to go up to Big Creek. That's about all I know of his story. On to the next one. Near Tillamook, a young couple had been swimming and then laying in the sun on the edge of the Wilson River. It was a very hot day in the 90s. The male witness saw something or someone down the river that was swinging back and forth with its head down the whole time. 
It moved up and down the river with no problem at all. When the female witness got up and moved to the middle of the river, it spotted them, froze, and then glared at them. The male witness went to the middle of the river as well, and it moved to the right of the river and hid in some bushes. It had big hair and long arms and did not act human-like at all. The male witness was wondering why it was wearing winter clothes on such a hot day. Then he realized that they were not clothes at all. It had reddish blonde hair and was six feet tall. It was also noticeably female. The sighting lasted one and a half hours. On to the next one. I hiked into the Sky Lake Wilderness to Squaw Lake to fish. Squaw Lake is located in dense alpine forest southeast of the upper end of Four Mile Lake and reached by trail three miles from the Four Mile Lake campground. When I reached the lake, mosquitoes were so bad that I made my way to the lake shore where an onshore wind kept most of them away from me. At the shore, I fished for a while when the wind briefly changed direction, blowing offshore. As the wind changed, I noticed a very foul smell. I remember thinking that there must be something dead in the willow thicket about 10 feet on the other side of the trail from where I was standing on the lake shore. This smell was followed shortly by a sound like something hitting a tree with a large rock or branch. This was followed a while later by what I passed off as a bird. But it was not like a sound made by a bird, but more like a high-pitched howling. This sound was like the scream recorded in Ohio on a Bigfoot website, and it gives me chills every time I replay it. This scream was followed by the tree-pounding sound again. By this time, I was becoming very unnerved and had an increasingly overwhelming feeling of being watched, and I did not want to find out what it was. So I gathered up my courage, made my way through the mosquitoes back to the trail, returned to the trailhead, and left the area. Returning on the trail, I noted a pine tree with two freshly broken branches about 10 feet above the ground. The branches were still partially attached, and it was right next to the trail. I had not noticed them when I passed before. It was early afternoon, clear and warm in the 80s. The site was a thick forested area near a high mountain lake with dense alpine forest surrounding the lake. Northeast of Mount McLaughlin, southwest and upper end of Four Mile Lake. On to the next one. I was with a group of bow hunters in a canyon above Pilot Rock, Oregon. My 12-year-old daughter and I were sitting in the brush waiting for the rest of the party to push the elk to us. We had been sitting in the dense trees since early in the morning, about 6 a.m., and for about three hours as my daughter wasn't keen on hiking through the canyon. We had been bugling the entire time. Because it was early fall, it was quite foggy up in the high areas. My daughter and I had been hearing what sounded like a branch thumping against the trees from down below us, but steadily approaching our hiding spot. I thought nothing of the sounds because one of the party was carrying antlers to rattle the elk. Eventually, the two of us began to hear distinct rustling noises near us, with a grunting and growling noise. The stench was unbelievable. It smelled like a combination of wet mop and wet dog hair that had molded for a while. I have been around a bear carcass, and it did not smell like this. I was quite frankly spooked. My daughter was likewise wanting to get out of the woods. We immediately climbed the canyon wall to where the four-wheelers were. The crashing sounds followed us. When the rest of the party caught up with us, they said they had seen me walking along the hill. Where they said they had spotted me was in nowhere close to where my daughter and I had been as it was straight down a pretty ragged elk trail that I would not have tried with my kid along. I have never been comfortable in that area again, and I refuse to hunt without someone with me. I have tried telling many people about this, but even my daughter, who was with me, scoffs and says it was a bear. The knocking sound and the continual approach of whatever it was being drawn to the bugling we were doing. 
It was not a bull elk, as we had not had any responses to the call. The entire party, all experienced hunters and campers, went back to the site and found scat that did not look like a deer, elk, or bear. Heads up, TMI. It was slimy green and in a large pile of half-eaten berries and leaves. This incident occurred around mid-morning on a foggy cold day. There were dense trees with lots of undergrowth of bushes. It was just off an elk trail with rocks, the site on the side of a fairly wide canyon. Three other bow hunters spotted so-called me, what we think is the alleged Sasquatch, on the other side of the hill. On to the next one. The main highway number six from Portland to Tillamook follows the Wilson River for some distance. A side road loops back on its other side and has a number of turnouts evidently sparsely used by fishermen and hunters. The couple, Kurt Vandervoort and Sean Jarvis, he 40, she presumably younger, first had lunch next to the river on the car side and then crossed over in bathing suits. On the other side, they found a spot in the sun the river in front of them making some noise between the projecting rocks. Not a lot of flow. The main highway was now behind them on their other side, perhaps 200 to 300 feet and slightly higher. Not visible through the forest, but clearly audible. Downstream from them was a minor barrier of trees, alders, lying across the river, and behind these, the river expanded to a wide, flat pond-like area about 300 feet long with overhanging trees on both sides, before it resumed its rocky, faster course at the lower end of this flat area is a house set back from the river from which, during my visit, two small and trusted girls with a dog came to the river to feed ducks. Two small and trusting girls with a dog came to the river to feed ducks and go to a beaver house. As they lay there, Kurt and Sean noticed a person who came out of the edge of the dense forest. Second growth alder and Douglas fir with old growth stumps with springboard notches and waded into the still area. Very soon they revised their opinion that the person must be weird since he wore a fur coat in the 90 degree heat. Kurt by this time suspected it to be a Sasquatch but didn't mention it to Sean to avoid upsetting her. They watched the weird person walking up and down in the middle of the river area at a distance of between 150 feet minimum and 300 feet maximum from them, always looking into the water but not catching anything. The creature was only to its calves in the water and had peculiarly long arms, a very short neck, about six to six and a half feet tall, walking very sure-footedly on the slippery large river cobbles, crossing which the couple called almost killed themselves. After about 30 minutes of this observation, Sean decided to go into the water. At this moment, the Sasquatch detected them for the first time, despite the fact they had brightly colored swimsuits on and had talked in conversational tones the entire time. So much for the Sasquatch's superhuman sensory acuity. The Sasquatch froze in the water and stood upright, just behind the barrier, to face them and look at them. Sean stood for a while, then sat down, and Kurt also got to the water's edge or into the water and sat down on a rock. They now gazed at each other with minimal apprehension. They noticed that its thick hair was really weird, though showing some gloss of dark brown color with red glints, the head evidently a bit lighter. They said if it had been a human at that distance, they could have recognized the person's face. But the Sasquatch's face was so dark that all they were impressed by was the deeply recessed eye area, meaning presumably brow ridges. Eventually, the Sasquatch made it over to their side of the river and climbed behind a bush, where it evidently thought itself concealed, but it bent over sideways to keep looking at the couple, who could see its head and upper body. By this time, they were both reasonably convinced of its non-human nature and got somewhat more apprehensive, returned across the river to their car and left. Sean declined to stop the few hundred feet downstream to look at the site from a different angle. They concluded on their own without hardly any prior knowledge that they had been dealing with a juvenile. There was no sexual characteristics visible and the head seemingly rather rounded. 
They estimate that their total encounter lasted close to an hour, which at such relatively close quarters must be a near record. But I think the Sasquatch was a juvenile and inexperienced and wanted to get an eyeful of these near-naked dwarves. The area is overrun by elk prints and very steep elk game trails. The adjacent mountainside is steep enough to require some use of hands on a game trail in addition to having an understory of waist to chest high ferns, brambles, and salal. Trying to go up these slopes seems highly unpromising. While at their camp earlier in the morning they had heard five hoots almost like an owl, though Kurt commented at that time that it was a weird time for an owl to hoot. They looked for footprints, but the area was not conductive to capturing any. The area is not far from other sightings and footprint recordings. On to the next one. In McMinnieville in Yarnhill County in Oregon, several campers at an isolated ranch were sitting around a campfire when they heard some noises in the brush. They went to look and found some weird footprints and followed them. They went through the woods and into the meadow and saw a huge, bizarre creature resembling a walking tree except for the head. The creature was walking through the meadow at a very fast pace. It scurried away as they shone a flashlight at it. Later that night, the campers saw a bright light shoot over the area at high speed. On to the next one. Near Lorraine in Lane County in Oregon, we sighted what we believed to be a Bigfoot while driving to the coast on Little Used Smith River Road. We were driving the convertible and Mel was videotaping the road as we drove. The Bigfoot, or whatever it was, came from behind a tree and ran quickly into the woods. It was about two football fields away and was in the video for a very short time. It appeared silver at that distance and seemed to run with its hands at its side. It happened so fast that we didn't stop and really didn't think about it until we reviewed the video. Two of us were driving down a country road. It was clear and sunny in mid-afternoon. On to the next one. At Detroit Lake in Marion County in Oregon at the Hoover Campground. A powerful roaring scream was heard by Dana and Charmaine while they were fishing on a dock approximately 150 meters west of the Hoover Campground. Located along the south side of the Detroit Lake where the Santium River empties into the lake. The scream emanated from a point along the lake to the west of where the witnesses were fishing. Approximately 30 to 40 seconds later, an unidentified fisherman was seen running away from where the scream had originated. Upon seeing him, the witnesses immediately joined the visibly panicked fisherman on the trail, and the three of them continued running until they reached the relative safety of the campground. Once there, the ladies asked, Did you hear that scream? The shaken fisherman replied, Hear it. Whatever that thing is was right next to me. After their brief conversation, Dana and Shermaine quickly struck their camp and drove back to Portland. On to the next one. At Withers Lake Paisley Ranger District, Fremont National Forest near Paisley Lake in Lake County in Oregon, tracks of three animals of different sizes were found at the edge of the lake in soft soil. It looked like they were feeding on underwater plants at one end of the lake. The tracks indicated that they were at that location on two different occasions. A single animal's tracks were first observed on a return visit. About two weeks later, there were three sets of tracks. All the tracks were at the edge of the lake where the large leaf underwater plant was growing. We observed that the plants had been stripped from the water where the tracks were found. The tracks were destroyed by weather, before plaster casts could be made. On to the next one. I believe hindsight is twenty twenty. So, what must have happened on that rainy autumn night had actually started many weeks earlier. My parents owned a house in a relatively rural area of western Pennsylvania. They had inherited the house from my father's parents, 
back in the day, it had been a fairly good-sized dairy farm with three large outbuildings and plenty of grass. It was originally on 175 acres, but that had been reduced to about 20 as bits and pieces were sold off over the years. The house itself had nine large rooms and had been built in the style of a southern plantation home. There hadn't been any dairy farming going on here in many, many years, but it was a beautiful home with a wraparound porch that ran across the front of the house and partway down the two sides. My mother insisted on living alone on the farm after my father had passed away. Initially, I had considered moving there with my wife, but my wife wasn't in favor of the idea. In order to keep the place, my wife and I stayed in our current home, which was about eight miles away from there. In the spring of 1981, my mother had started to make somewhat regular calls about a prowler lurking around her house. On some occasions, someone was even attempting to turn the doorknob. Prior to my father's passing, no such happenings were ever mentioned there, nor had anything of the sort occurred while I was growing up there. I had run over there at all times of the day and night to check things out for her, but I was never able to find anything unusual. I responded to her calls on at least 20 different occasions over a period of only a few months, and she realized this was becoming a burden on me and started to call the local police instead. At some point, I spoke to the police about her, and one of the officers suggested that maybe she shouldn't be living alone there anymore. I was in total agreement, but in spite of the events, my mother would have none of it. The calls kept coming, so late in August, I told my mom that I was going to get her a dog. Now, my mom was in her late 70s. She liked animals, but she didn't feel like she could walk it properly or take care of it. So I suggested that we could have a trainer work with the dog so that she could let it out alone. All she would have to do is open the door and let it out and then let it back in again later. After much prodding, she agreed to my proposal. So we bought a beautiful German shepherd from a local breeder and she named him Freddy. After this, the nature of the calls changed. Instead, saying that she saw or heard something, the call would always report that the dog was going crazy and barking at a window or scratching at the door while trying to get out of the house. And this went on for a couple of months. Even though she had a dog, I was still going over there to calm her down and do a walk around the property. I told her to let the dog out if she heard something and he would scare whatever it was off but she would have no part of it. She thought he might get hurt. On one of the nights that I got a call, it was raining quite hard outside, and yet again she had said something was walking on the porch, and Freddy was going ballistic. When I arrived, I walked up to the door in the usual way, but I noticed wet, muddy prints going around the porch. They ran up and down the entire length of the porch, but they didn't have enough shape to be identifiable. I went in the house and asked my mother if she or the dog had been outside. She said that she let Freddy out prior to sunset, but that she had watched him go out and do his business and then called him right back into the house. Now, I didn't tell her what I had just seen, but this entire ordeal had just taken a turn for the worse. There really had been something or someone on her deck that night. And knowing that, how could I possibly leave her alone? I told her that she would either have to let Freddy out if she heard something or she would have to move, saying that we got this dog for her protection and she had to let him do his job. About a week had gone by and she hadn't called once, so I stopped by to see how she was doing. She told me she wasn't going to call and bother me anymore and I told her she had to call if she felt like she was in danger. This entire situation had gone from bad to worse, and I was beside myself. Once again, I insisted she had to let the dog out the next time anything happened. On my way back home, I stopped by the police headquarters and told them about the muddy prints on the deck. They said that I had to get my mother out of there, saying that it could be a bear, and it might break in at some point. I agreed, 
but I couldn't help thinking about her saying that something was walking by the windows. Bears don't walk around on their hind feet. One stormy night in the fall of 1981, my phone rang, and I answered it. My mother had a scare and let Freddy out. She said she heard him make a loud yelp outside and that all the barking had stopped abruptly, after which she had heard what she thought was a large branch falling on the roof. I drove to her home, went inside, and asked where Freddy was. She was crying hysterically and told me that he had disappeared after that yelp. So I went outside and called him over, but he never came. I couldn't see anything. I told my mother to come and spend the night with us and that I couldn't leave her alone like this. The next day, we returned to her house with my wife in tow. My wife took my mother inside of the house while I stayed outside. As I walked around toward the backyard, I noticed some large depressions in the soft grass. There was about six of them in a line, and they all held a bit of water from the rain. These were massive footprints of some kind, and I put my fingers in one of them, and it was about five inches deep. I could see more shallow prints going out into the pasture, so I followed them out for a bit, but found nothing else. As I walked back toward the house, I thought about what my mother had said about a branch falling on the roof. So I looked up, wondering if I could see whatever it was from the yard. Lying in one of the roof's valleys was Freddy's body, and I knew it immediately. I didn't tell my mother or my wife. We brought my mother back to our house, and, in private, I told my wife I would explain everything later. When I had some time alone, I returned to the house with a policeman in tow. I showed him the dog and told him of what had happened during the night. We put a ladder up to the house to get him down, and he was so heavy that I had to drag him to the roof's edge and let him fall the rest of the way to the ground, the dog's head having been twisted all the way around. I dug a grave behind the barn, and we buried him together. The policeman took photos of both the dog and the depression in the ground, and this was a turning point for my mom. She didn't know what I had found, but we convinced her to stay with us and sell the house. I have been wrestling with this mystery ever since. We all like to think that we have everything figured out, but when you stand there looking at a 125-pound dead dog that's been thrown up onto a 35-foot tall roof, you start to wonder if you know anything at all. I hope you enjoyed those encounters, and if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!